that is the most important topic on earth, peace. What kind of a peace do I mean and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. Well, hello, everyone. This is Dark Journalist, and thank you for joining me in this live broadcast. You know, we're going to be doing part two of an update on the JFK Records release that's happening now, and we'll be doing a couple more of these before my JFK assassination special, closer to the anniversary on November 22nd, to try to really get into the details of these records. Today, we'll be joined by Forbidden Knowledge TV's Alexandra Bruce. That's if the streaming video holds up. Now, uh... We had a very interesting run-up to the record release, as a lot of you noticed. Um, it was kind of fascinating, actually, because Trump, on one hand, was really, you know, talking tough and saying he was going to release them all. And at the last minute, they pulled back some. There was backlash, and then Trump turned around again and said, "No, I am going to release them, but we'll redact some names." But there was a lot of heavy pushback on the intelligence side. So we're going to look at that, and um, we're going to look into all the kind of vagaries and details around these documents. And I'm here with Alexandra Bruce from Forbidden Knowledge TV. Uh, Alexandra, are you there? Yes. I just introduced you, so you're, you're right on time. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. It's great to have you because, you know, when we did the special on this last week, it was kind of fascinating. We didn't yet have all the details. And it was an interesting lead up. You could tell there was some wrangling going on between the intelligence agencies and Trump. And the media was really, you know, going heavy for it. You could tell that they were nervous also. But there was a big buildup. And then by the end of that day, the word came out, yes, some of the files will come out. But Trump said in a statement, I have no choice. Can't let certain documents out. How did you feel when we got that? word down at the end of the day well it just felt like a sucker punch it just felt like it it it, it definitely felt like uh whoever was in charge with uh public affairs was not you know the, the, there was a lack of a alignment with the message you know it seemed a little discombobulated yes yeah yeah it was certainly discombobulated um and did you feel kind of a letdown because the administration had talked so tough about releasing this stuff? Yeah, but, uh, you know, I wasn't exactly shocked either. I was like, hmm, what a, just more, more crap. Right. But it was a very interesting how the, the sort of the recovery, if you will, was like, I am, I'm going to release stuff. Like the next day, Trump said stuff. It's just like, what's going on over there? <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it was pretty wild. I have to say it was a pretty wild ride. But um, by the next day, he was saying, oh, I'm going to release everything. Yeah. And now they have a thing, and it's called rolling. We're going to roll these reports out. Uh, so we're going to see how this goes. Rolling. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little unusual. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty easy. You press a button and they're in the National Archives, digitize them, and everybody can get at them. Right. So what they do have out, um, I have copies of them now, all the zip files, and I've been going through them. And I want to discuss a couple of the items with you that came out of these documents. But I also want to get into the larger picture around the national security state takeover uh, that started over 50 years ago. And That's started what the story is really about. You know. It is. It is. We're going to get into a few of these details just because they're new, and, and it'll it'll lead into that. But I, I agree with you, actually, because we're both on the same page. If someone were to go to ForbiddenKnowledgeTV.net and look at your various um, political videos about the JFK assassination, this overarching theme emerges of one half of the national security state taking over the other half. And uh, that sort of public, you know, covert overt situation where the covert side overtook the public state is really the setup. And that's really what happened in 63. That's why it's such a major secret. That's why they've kept it hidden. And the assassination uh, of Kennedy was very important, I think, in all that. So let's get into some of these details. Here's a, one that I found particularly interesting. 
which was there was an FBI memo from uh, actually this is really fascinating it was a special agent named Clements and he was tracking someone named Orrin Fenton Polito who was giving these speeches after the assassination and seemed to have a great deal of knowledge about it. They were very curious about him. He was connected with a lot of political figures and right-wing groups. But one of the things that he stated was that, quote, the Surgeon General's report on the assassination stated that the first bullet entered the president's throat below the Adam's apple, unquote. Um, and then he goes on to say you know, that it showed two persons were involved with the first shot being fired from the bridge in front of the car. Now, this is all very interesting because they're trying to wrap everything around this lone nut theme. Right, and that it's very significant that this first, uh, you know, Surgeon yeah. General is talking about two shooters. And if you've seen that photograph, it's very clearly an entry wound, not an exit wound. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's fascinating because this, you know, this showing that the Surgeon General's report is mentioned in the FBI file. And they don't say in the FBI file, that's clearly wrong. It's almost like they know that the Surgeon General had this, you know, uh, and I'm, that would be the first person that they would show these types of photos to to see, like, do you think what kind of wounds are these? Well, I think that's an authoritative uh, source. <laughs> the Surgeon General. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> um, it is kind of fascinating, though, because I think in response to this, we've seen um, some of these details that are coming out, but we've seen something very fascinating which is the CIA is coming out and saying, well, you know what, maybe Oswald didn't act alone. Maybe he was with KGB agents. Oh, All right, so. Again, with the Russophobia, it's just. It's beyond, it, it is truly beyond. Uh, I'm gonna try to play this clip of James Woolsey and we're gonna see how it goes. Okay. Um, people on, on the texting and hello everyone. <laughs> it's good to see you there. Uh, let me know if you can actually hear this because I, it might be the kind of thing that might help it out. It's just about a 30 second clip of Woolsey, who's the former CIA director. Under Clinton. Under Clinton, right. And uh, is very interesting history around him, UFOs, and Stephen Greer that we'll get into. But anyway, very odd individual. And the new CIA line, I guess they wanted to trot him out to try it. And that is that, well, if Oswald was working with anyone, it was with the KGB. Which oh, it's just yeah. absolutely absurd, especially on a day like today when, when Mueller was actually forced to admit that, uh, you know, that the real crimes, the only things that he could uncover had to do with uh, the state of Ukraine, which yeah. is an anti-Russian uh, oh, yeah. the CIA, so. Exactly. They booted out the pro-Russian guy, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let, let's see if they need a geography lesson, like the Ukraine. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's the okay. Russia scandal, not the Ukrainian scandal. Let's get real. Like really, it's like 180. It's they're a po totally oppositional. I definitely think that they were attempting to change the narrative quick from this, everything else that's going on. So we're going to get into that. But let's try to play this clip. It's from Wolsey. And people in chat, you can tell me if you can actually hear this. Let's give it a shot than you today. Great to be with you, Danny, and congratulations on your news. Well, thanks, and we hope that you come back often. So I want to bring up one thing here. In the, one of the documents, there is a statement here from um, one of the attorneys, uh, David Berlin. He asked, is there any information involved with the assassination of President Kennedy, which in any way shows that Lee Harvey Oswald was in some way a CIA agent, and then it cuts off? What do you think that's about? Um, I think there is some possible information that he was a KGB, but not a CIA. <laughs> okay. I mean, officer, you know, agent. I'll tell you what, well, this goes on and on, okay, but this is their line, okay? So they're saying, well, you know what, in fact, he may have worked with somebody else, but it was a KGB agent, he's not CIA. And this is their whole new approach, so that if these documents get out, if new leaks get out, if WikiLeaks, who offered a $100,000 bounty for these records, if that gets out, that their backup is, well, yes, we try to keep this, you know, we try to protect the country all this time. And in fact, you know, Oswald was a KGB agent and he had Confederates who were KGB agents and we didn't want to start World War III. I mean, that's pretty much where they're going with this. Oh, that's so, uh, thank you for sparing us World War III, CIA. <laughs> nice of you. <laughs> I mean, really. Uh, my, my friends, I have other friends who are complete 
fanatics, uh, you know, students of the JFK assassination. And I was told to expect this, expect exactly this, um, this attempt to, um, to blame the assassination on, on the KGB, which makes absolutely no sense at all, since uh, JFK was, was proposing uh, working closer with Russia uh, for security purposes because, because that document that you found that's in the JFK library, um, because of the uncertainty, because of UFOs. And not only UFOs, but things like meteors have, have triggered potential, uh, you know, Nuclear threats. On, yeah, situations. Um, yeah. No question. Various nations, between India and Pakistan even, there was a meteor shower that almost caused World War III between those two nations because they both have nukes. So, I think it's particularly pertinent when we're hearing all this stuff about nuclear war with North Korea, you know, and one of the big things during the campaign was that the Clintons were really pushing this Cold War 2.0 scenario where the Russians this, the Russians that, and the Democrats are still doing that along with the media, um, although it makes no sense. And then you get hardline Republicans who are doing it. And these are uh, neocons. These are neocons who need a strategy of tension uh, in order to uh, justify their own existence, justify their budgets, justify, you know, a, a massive uh, defense buildup, basically. The only way, and so, and very much because they're so powerful, they, they've infiltrated all branches and, and parties of the government, um, it, it's very much uh, invaded the American sense of self. It's almost like there are, I don't know, I mean, if people who aren't politically active, I don't think so, but I think uh, people who think, who fancy themselves as politically active might need to have Russia be an enemy in order to justify their Americanness. And if they're on that train, I would advise them to get off because that's just a, a losing uh, proposal for, for everyone. There's no question about it. Um, this is what they were promising on the Clinton side, which is we'll take on Russia, right? Everything was, we're encircling Russia. And uh, Russia had done a few things, obviously, to tweak off that sort of Davos crowd. One of them was that they, they weren't going to allow GMOs in Russia. Uh, which is a big deal because you know they were looking for control through food. Uh, that's gigantic. They were creating their own monetary SWIFT system so that for clearing payments they were going to have their own. Uh, they already have a version of it, but you know these are the types of processing is huge. Yes, it's a huge part of uh, the ultimate. You know the central banker control paradigm. There are only a few. Um, transaction processing nodes on the planet. One of them is somewhere in New York City, and the president doesn't even know what that address is, I've been told. And another one is in Malaysia, of all places, which is interesting because we saw that weird terrorism with the uh, Malaysian Airlines in 2014. You know, the, the Right, yeah. right, right, yeah. That is very strange. Um, I think in, in any case with Putin, they have a real problem, but here again, 54 years later, what was the issue in 1963 when JFK was assassinated? It was Khrushchev and the tensions with the Soviet Union. We were looking at the same type of situation. Of course, Russia was at the heart of that. Now, uh, when we look at the situation and the breaking point that it came to, there are memos like the ones that you referenced, uh, like the NASA memo, which is National Security Action Memo 271, where um, Kennedy called for cooperation with the Soviets in outer space matters. And then there's a CIA uh, FOIA request document that came out that's widely reported in European media, um, which is the UFO quote memo. And that's JFK actually talking about knowns versus unknowns. And it's actually called the release of all intelligence files relating to UFOs, um, sharing that information with the Soviets. Which is, which is a subject line, you know, bomb, bombshell of a subject line of whatever. Well, how, big, how big of a problem is that in 1963 for these deep state continuity of government players who want to keep all this stuff secret? And you've got a president in there who not only knows about the subject but wants to share it. Well, but the thing is, I guess the problem was bigger than even that, which was we might have a nuclear exchange because there are UFOs, like, tripping the, the, the sensors, you know? Right, 
right? And this is very crucial, I think, which is he's saying in the memo, if they see one of these UFOs and they think it's us gathering intelligence, basically, then it might trigger a nuclear incident. Yeah. So that that's the level that they talked about these things on. Um, you know, one of my last interviews with the late Jim Mars, who did incredible work around the assassination and the deeper intelligence around UFOs and some of the reasons that this came up. And he talked about the planetary group. And the planetary group was very interesting because in the 40s, they tracked UFO crashes and sightings and things along that line because it was quite a wave in 47 when all that stuff came up. Interestingly enough, one of the first briefings they gave was to Congressman Kennedy because he was part of naval intelligence previously and he was on these committees that studied uh, you know, various threats to the US. And they, so he thoroughly knew about these crashes at the time. And Mars went in to make sure that the group and the files were legitimate. And uh, he, he came to the conclusion that they were. Let's watch this clip of him here, uh, puzzling over these details and sorting it out. This is sadly uh, from my last interview with him before he passed away recently, but uh, incredible researcher and here with incredible information about JFK's knowledge of UFOs. So he knew, he knew. In fact, there's a real interesting tie in there. Back in the 40s, there was a government uh, group called the Interplanetary Phenomenon Group which when I first heard about that, I said, oh, that's just got to be some kind of joke, you know, <laughs> but it was very real. It's been documented. There are documents now found from this group. And in 1947, they actually produced a report on the Roswell crash. And it is pretty specific and pretty out there. They talked about two different landing zones, LZ1, LZ2. They talked about multiple bodies being found. They talked about uh, the whole thing. They And they gave names, dates, places. They also were the first that I know that mentioned that before the crash in Roswell, there were all kinds of sightings around New Mexico. And in fact, they had been picking up unidentified objects on their radar. Uh, and it was becoming quite a concern to them. Uh, through the first part of that week in July pre preceding the uh, crash uh, at Roswell. But in the back of this report, it said one of the few members of Congress to have knowledge of this is Representative John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts. Huh. And it said uh, he had served in naval, he was in naval intelligence, and was an officer in naval intelligence, and that he apparently had a source of information within the uh, Office of the Secretary of the Air Force, or, yeah, Secretary of the Air Force, I guess. Uh, at that time, it would have been the Army Air, Air, Air Corps. Um, now, that's true. Uh, most people only know Kennedy's background as being the commander of the PT-109, right, in which he got sunk by a Japanese uh, destroyer in the South Pacific. But it's true that prior to that, he had served in Washington with naval intelligence. So see, uh, that tells you that th this is a legitimate report. And that tells you that us that Kennedy, as far back as 1947, knew that uh, the Roswell was the real deal and that something very unearthly had happened there. So I think that's, that's pretty powerful. And we have to remember that if there is a secret going in, you know, when Kennedy gets the presidency, the one thing, you know, there's a number of factors that he wants, the deep state wants to control JFK about, but certainly the UFO matter is gigantic because they don't plan to ever disclose this fact to the public. And yeah. well, I think, you know who makes a great case is um, Rochester, I, New York, upstate where it's cold. Oh, oh, uh, Richard Dillon. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, his, his great work was UFOs in the National Security State. That's the right. it's book it's two. A very convincing case, an awesome case that Richard Dillon made. Very well documented. Uh, that yeah. really shows it's a very, uh, it makes a lot of sense that that was the whole reason for this national security apparatus that we have today. I mean, yeah, that and the, and the, and the atom bomb. I mean, they're almost like they're used sort of against, you know, the, it's like a shadow play between one and the other a little bit. It makes sense. It does make sense for a number of reasons. One of the reasons it makes sense is it represents amazing energy, right? Technological advancement. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that we can say how these things mirror each other when you talk about national security incidents. So when you're discussing Roswell, for example, well, when the national security state came under fire about that in the 90s, really, I mean, it, 
in the 80s it trickled out, but in the 90s it was a full-blown movement. And the Air Force felt compelled to write a huge report on it. It was the most ridiculous thing in the world where they said, oh, they were crash test dummies, even though yeah. they didn't really use them until the 50s. Uh, similar to what happened with the JFK, uh, you know, have Congress having to revisit that whole thing. And so, yeah, yeah we were treated to headlines on the New York Times, you know, with, with ridiculous pictures of dummies and, and um, yeah, and, and, and well, and promises to uh, release the, the, the files that we're getting today. Yes, um, that is fascinating too, because they wanted them in the 70s, of course, and these things trickled out. Mm -hmm. I do think that um, one of the more unheralded chapters in the whole JFK saga is the work of the Association Record, Reward, uh, Record Review Board. They are very fascinating, ARRB, and uh, Judge Tenheim still comes out uh, and gives, he was the head of the board. And what they had to do was review these documents and figure out which ones could be released to the public without causing damage to our reputation or intelligence matters. Um, but really some of the best work came out of what they did. And it's really their work that gives us the foundation for understanding the knowledge that the intelligence community had about Oswald, which is absolutely crucial if you're going to get anywhere in terms of solving the equation. You know, it's one thing to say, Oswald was a CIA agent. I made a documentary, Agent Oswald, the CIA patsy. He was clearly associated with intelligence. But one thing that you can show on the record is that even though they deny it, that the CIA was aware of Oswald. And this is a crucial uh, thing, I think, to keep in mind because you have to ask yourselves, why were they lying about who this person was? Now, I'm going to go into him for a minute here um, because I think this is significant. Oswald is in the Civil Air Patrol at the age of 15. David Ferry uh, is the unit commander. And Ferry is a right wing. Uh, he's connected with CIA. He's connected with the mafia. Um, and interestingly enough, when we get into Oswald's life a little bit, it's, it's very unusual. It's got all of the fingerprints of intelligence. Even when he goes to the Soviet Union, it's somebody's operation. Because, of course, he has no money to go traveling around the world, etc. And people have looked into that. But I think Oswald is significant in a few ways because we have this memo from J. Edgar Hoover in 1960, and it says, watch out, someone's using <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald's passport and birth certificate here and identifying himself, even though Oswald's in Russia. And you got to ask yourself, how important was Oswald that the FBI director is writing memos about him three years before the assassination? So that's far from some kind of loser nobody that no one cares about uh, and who was frustrated because he was in a minimum wage job and decided he was going to assassinate the president. I mean, that story is so ridiculous. Yeah, no, it makes no sense. And, and uh, um, why, why would uh, the FBI be knowing about him too? That that's, seems a little confusing also. Well, let's go, let's go even deeper. Yeah. Um, Oswald and his wife are staying at the home of Ruth and Michael Payne. Mm -hmm. Ruth Payne is a Quaker, and Michael Payne works for Bell Helicopter as an air engineer. His boss is Walter Dornberger. Walter Dornberger is one of the Nazis that we brought over here uh, during Paperclip, and he was actually wanted for crimes uh, under the judgment at Nuremberg trials. So uh, full-on SS, and he was associated with a couple of interesting things, the rocket program, and uh, which is one of the reasons they grabbed him, but also this Bell project, which is this really, um, you know, and I've gone into this in my interviews with Joseph Farrell, but in any case, very exotic technology, we'll put it that way. So Dornberger is Michael Payne's boss, and it just so happens that the Paynes take in Oswald mm. and his wife. And all of the evidence that convicts Oswald in the public arena comes out of their household. So these are very unusual connections for someone who's supposed to be a lone, disgruntled person. All the ridiculous reports I've been reading all weekend and, and in the run-up in the uh, you know the past few days to this documents release, it's all the same stuff. You know, deeply troubled Oswald, psychological profile showed he was a psycho. You know all these things, and really none of that pans out at all. In fact, there aren't any psyche valves of Lee Harvey Oswald, except when he was 13, 
uh, because he had a fight in school or something along that line. And how deep are you going to go with someone who's 12 or 13 to figure out their entire life's profile? You know, so it's not like he had a psychiatrist who kept long records of, of his, um, you know, psyche valve sections or something. This is all made up stuff. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the absurdity. I mean, anyway, so, so what else is new? What else came out? Well, uh, what's interesting is, and what I think is probably the most important piece of the pie uh, that came out from these files so far, is that there is a British reporter who received a telephone call 25 minutes before the assassination that told him something big was going to happen in America and to call the U.S. Embassy in London and to tell them that. Right. That, that was and, fascinating. I, uh, that was brand new. Yeah. I, I that. And it's just eerily similar to the um, World Trade Center 7 broadcast that the BBC made 20 minutes. Yes. Or, you know, she's talking about the tower going down and it's like standing right behind her. I mean, everyone's everyone's seen this. Uh, yes. it's, it's, yeah. real, it's just great. It is. I have a... Um, it's about this tower going down 20 minutes before it goes down. I put that clip in my interview. Which it is. I mean, I've actually been, I was in that building. I used to live half a block away from the, the WTC complex. Oh. I've been in there to try to file a case, a, a fraud case. So, like, I knew exactly what building it was. And I was like, what are you guys talking about? Right. It's pretty interesting. One of the things uh, I think about this call that's fascinating is that this reporter in the files, they suggest that he was very reliable source for MI5, which is basically the British equivalent of the CIA. And you wonder if this wasn't the CIA tipping off their MI5 source that this was coming, because we know how close those guys dance together. Um, in any case, who is this person and how did they know? It's a totally anonymous tip. But how do they know? That they never, you know, they, they haven't gotten to the bottom of it, so it's kind of, it's interesting. It's like a, it's like smoke where there's smoke, there's fire, but that's all. It's just smoke, kind of. Well, well, it's um, it's a little more than smoke. No, it is. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you the significance of it. Mm -hmm. The entire CIA's case, and the entire FBI's case, is built on the fact that Oswald was a lone nut who decided to do this on a whim, and it just so happened that he was lucky enough to get a job at the Texas School Book Depository six weeks before the yeah. press. Uh, obviously, Oswald was placed in that position. There's no question about it. And I can go into the details about it. In fact, when I mentioned that Oswald worked, um, was in the Civil Air Patrol in his teens, the man who founded the Civil Air Patrol, uh, D.H. Byrd, is the same guy who owned the Texas School Book Depository. It's a very unusual yeah. figure. Uh, major donor to the Johnson machine, uh, LBJ's machine, and his cousin was Admiral Byrd, <laughs> wow. who did the famous Antarctic uh, expedition. So it's a very deep, deep player. And, you know, everywhere you see on that chessboard Oswald moving around, we, we find him with these deep military, deep state intelligence connections. I mean, there's no getting around it. Um, but the call is significant because if their case is based and this is for history, because this is how the history books read now. And if you say it any other way, according to our academic institutions, you'd be wrong. Um, they say that he acted alone, got a whim in his head, and did this. All right, It's already been debunked even by their own House Assassinations Committee, said it didn't happen this way. But anyway, taking it on the face of it, this is what they say. If somebody had knowledge that the assassination was going to happen 25 minutes before uh, it took place, then that clearly shows um, foreknowledge of the event, meaning they're collaborating with uh, someone on the assassination. And it's and, uh, not just a lone nut anymore. It's people exactly. calling TV stations in another country. Exactly. And so what does that tell you? I mean, in a way, if you think about these documents, there's going to be so many details and they're going to say, well, maybe there was a mafia thing or the CIA was using the mafia and all that. Of course, we know that. That's all a fact. You know, the CIA used the mafia in these uh, ways to eliminate other heads of state and to infiltrate elections and all the rest of it. So that's not news. But what is news, in a sense, is this documented little piece that Oswald 
in fact, uh, was not the lone nut because 25 minutes before the assassination, someone else knew about it. Of course, there's no good evidence for Oswald being the assassin because even the first reports of the officers who arrived on the scene found a different rifle. And one of them owned a sporting goods stores that sold rifles. So he certainly understood weaponry. And uh, that was the 7.65 Mauser. They wrote affidavits to that effect. They were the first ones on the scene. They were the ones who saw it. Strangely enough, the rifle morphs, even in CBS News reports, about three hours later, they change it to Manlikar Kokano, which is the rifle they can link to Oswald. So um, in any kind of real legal process, any kind of regular court case, none of that information would, would hold up. And a lot of legal experts have said that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if it's the first, but it's certainly um, in our, maybe in, in our in modern era, the first of many uh, circumstances where, you know, like 9-11, like the Vegas shooting, you have just absurd things being said. You know, 19 um, Muslim hijackers with, with box cutters did 9-11. I mean, and that's still the official line. I mean, it's absurd. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, you know, the James Earl, uh, whatever, James Earl Paddock. James Earl Paddock. <laughs> yeah, Lee Harvey Paddock, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Shot 500 people. I mean, they're doing it now. That's, that's, I think, the relevance is that it really it should be instructive. Like, this is when they really started to do this stuff in earnest, I think. Or at least this is when they had to construct all this stuff, you know, uh, using mass media, using television. Because really prior to 19, early 1960s, I don't know how many Americans had uh, TV in their living room. But that's really how the official story was propagated. Um, and that's how everything is propagated. It's all for TV now. It's done on TV. Well, a lot of it was mind control, but like right off the bat, that's the thing. Um, for example, Hoover is writing memos, and this is one of the new things that came out. Hoover wrote a memo on November 24th saying, we need to convince the public that, quote, uh, the public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin. <laughs> well, that's no, uh, and that's after Oswald is killed. So no investigation, nothing. He's saying within a few hours of Oswald being killed and only two days after the president's assassinated, we've got to convince the public that Oswald did it. Now, uh, Katzenbach, who's the assistant attorney general, who's the acting attorney general because RFK was grief stricken, um, he wrote a memo saying very much the same thing. We have to convince the public that Oswald was guilty. That's basically mind control because they're telling their, you know, it's like from the top down, this is the word that has to go out. Now, I don't think that's just... Why? why? Why do we have to convince people that that's it instead of whatever the truth was? Because that wasn't it. Yeah. And if we're getting, we're going through the same thing today with, with the Las Vegas shooting. Yeah. Uh, and of course, something like the Las Vegas shooting is very interesting in that uh, it's got a lot of the earmarks of one of these deep events that we've seen. Mm -hmm. And I think more details need to come out about it to get a really good picture, but I know that you're doing a lot of reporting on it now. And if people want to find out more about that, I recommend they check out a lot of the, the new videos that you're running about it. Um, I want to get into this thought for a minute because we're talking about operations in 9-11 and everyone cites this operation Northwoods. And as a matter of fact, uh, I was on a radio show and somebody said, well, you know, the uh, CIA and the government covering up this assassination and intelligence taking part in it doesn't surprise me any. Aren't you familiar with Operation Northwoods? And of course, I'm familiar with Operation Northwoods, which was uh, this plan that the Joint Chiefs had, uh, and it involved basically the you know the idea of creating a false flag to blame Cuba, and it emerged because of the JFK Records Act. I think it did in in the 90s. You know, it's really interesting. It it came tumbling out in 1998, and you're probably right. It probably came out in the ARRB. Uh, yeah, I, um, I looked it up, and it, it did. It was. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. Well, what's fascinating about it is that Kennedy strenuously objected, and that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. But what I told uh, the person who asked the question was, you know, they said this 
shouldn't surprise you and, and all the rest of it because of that document. But Operation Northwoods wasn't accomplished. They didn't do it. The JFK assassination is something that happened. They, they, they moved from the deep state, mm -hmm. from that covert level, and they attacked the public level. They took the public level out to change the direction of the country. That's the difference. It's one thing to say they'll do anything, but when they actually do anything and we have a record of it, then that's, that's when we need to get a handle on what the event was and demand that kind of clarity and demand uh, that kind of transparency. That's why the idea of the records is important, even if there's nothing particularly crucial in there. Honestly, I think the crucial work in this case has been done by people like Peter Dale Scott and uh, Jim Mars and um, Jefferson Morley's done a lot of great work around the CIA role. Um, but I don't think anyone gets to what I think is the linchpin part, and it's something you mentioned earlier, which is this advanced exotic technology UFO part, which plays such a huge role, especially if you wanted to share that with Russia. Right. Well, I guess that there was a bigger danger, you know, which was uh, that lack of communication could, could lead to an inadvertent, you know, nuclear exchange. And that was a bigger problem than, than any, you know, secrets that we wanted to keep. Well, it's interesting because so many people might point to different areas where they might say, you know, JFK was certainly a, a threat, a national security threat. But um, what makes him a national security threat to these people when you get right down to it? And that is all we have time for today. Thank you, Alexandra. Again, great work at Forbidden Knowledge TV. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, just a reminder here, make sure you visit darkjournalist.com to stay up to date on our reports and sign up for our newsletter to stay in touch. There are more JFK assassination uh, records release reports that are on the way. And I'll see you soon.